Hello YouTube and welcome back. This is Daily Vinyl. That's me. I'm Joey Party. This is uh, everything we talk here is record related and music related, but this specifically is episode number three of Buy This on Vinyl. And while there is a ton of information out there on music and places to go and things to see, um, I just like talking about it. So if you're here, I'm assuming you like hearing about it too. And if you're going to stick with me, I want you to know that every episode we sort of break down a handful of different albums into different parts and sections. But every single episode has a theme. On this week's episode, the theme is Sad Bastard Music. Let's check it out. All right, so if you're still with me and you're going, what is sad bastard music? Well, by all uh, intents and purposes, there is a lot of sad music in the world, and there is uh, a wealth of genres that explore the uh, topics of sadness, emotional driven sadness, and, um, you know, Trent Reznor, one of my idols, a lot of sad music there. The Downward Spiral in particular is one that deals with a heavy topic of suicide. However, for the sake of this video, for this week's episode of Buy This on Vinyl, I want to think about music that not only is sad uh, at the root of it, but music that sort of evokes a feeling of sadness. If there was a, a way to tangibly take depression and turn it into an audible sound, most of this music is that. Um, and, and by default, it is music that when people hear you listening to it, they feel like you're listening to sad music. They don't even have to hear the words. So let's dive into this. Um, every episode cuts into a couple of chunks, and I want to start with the first chunk being none other than the obvious choices. So some of the obvious sad bastard musical choices. And uh, no video list of sad music would be complete without my idol, my, my hero, um, none other than Ryan Adams. Uh, Ryan is up there for me on some of the best songwriting you can get. And this album, Prisoner, I've got the really neat slip mat with it because my wife spoiled me when it came out, um, is the closest thing to a, I guess, concept album he ever put out. It's, it's telling the story of his divorce uh, in chapters. And uh, there was so much to it that he released a collection of B-sides, an entire seven-inch box set thereafter. All really good, too. But this is a summation. This is sort of a, a to Z, if you will, of that. And this record, I mean, the name is Prisoner. Um, is this my favorite Ryan Adams record? No, but it is definitely one of the best. Um, and it's because I think where Ryan usually writes songs for characters he builds, this is his most honest, most uh, self, I guess, admittive, music. It's very, very personal for him, and I think that's why it took so long to come out after his situation. Um, put out on Paxam, there's a ton of variants out there, all different colors you can get your hands on if that's something you're into. Um, but really, I just like music. <laughs> I'll buy variants if they happen to be, but it's not something I'm after. But I highly recommend as an obvious choice, number one, I can't not mention my boy, Ryan Adams. Moving right along, if you know the sort of singer-songwriter sound that I'm talking about now, if you're kind of getting an idea of what I'm referring to by sad bastard music, I, I want to take you back, okay? Before I was even born, 1982, uh, there is a, a, a world-recognized musician, and he's, he's cutting tracks, and he's got demo versions of something, and as opposed to putting a his band together and recording live versions, he decides, I'm going to release this like it is. And this is the boss, Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska. Um, Nebraska is a train wreck <laughs> in a good way. It's very, very raw. Um, I love everything about this because it's not like anything you really hear from Springsteen on the radio. The man has a humongous collection of music out there um, but like the river which is a very very sad song um, Nebraska is full of emotional dialogue um, just sort of a dark place that he creates for you and I mean this sort of black and white gritty image sort of sums that up for you um, I really like the track my father's house there's something mystical about it um, 
a lot of harmonica work and usage throughout here with Bruce. Um, and it's weird because it's not fluid. A lot of times you hear harmonica and it comes in over the top of a song and it really goes alongside the harmony or adds a layer of harmony that sort of works for you. In this album in particular, I think Bruce was maybe channeling his inner Dylan. <laughs> and by that I mean the harmonica is sort of in between lyrical phrases in a way that doesn't necessarily add to the melody. Obviously isn't taking away from it. But again, these songs are more emotionally driven and thus I don't think that it matters. Um, what I have here is a a, a, a release um, that was sold from all places. Um, Prize Electronics has a, the additional sleeve, but they've got it in a really nice, it's, it's almost like wax paper sleeve here. It's 180 gram, it's remastered. Uh, they call it audiophile vinyl, um, if you know the term. And it sounds fantastic. Uh, I do love this one, and I think if you're trying to showcase to somebody that all of his songs aren't Baby We Are Born to Run, well, I think you can't go wrong with Nebraska. Now, moving back into more current time frames, I am a, a child of modern alternative music, 80s alternative music, all things counterculture, and I really embrace um, indie rock and festival music and all of those things at the core of me. Uh, thus, from their very early beginnings all the way up until more recent albums, I have loved a band by the name of The National. Um, and The National is pretty big. That's why I would put this in the obvious category. Um, Gatefold Here With Trouble Will Find Me. Not their most recent release, but for me, their album that I listen to the most from beginning to end. I listen to all their records a ton. Um, and his dull... Um, sort of very low baritone vocal um, really, really sells that sort of sad depression as a sound sort of, uh, I guess, aesthetic that we're talking about here. On this record in particular, the patience that is expressed through their ability to really take their time with these tracks um, is one that I equate to, I guess, profound artism. artism. And that's when an artist is so comfortable in their music that they're not continuously looking to hammer onto the bigger sounds or, you know, have to have that crescendo to sort of make something more out of a song. It's more about telling a story in a delicate way. And um, I think that's something The National has done very well for a long time. Um, Don't Swallow the Cap and I Need My Girl, two of the standout tracks on this record. Lyrically dark uh, throughout most of their music is um, and uh, well the title alone says a lot trouble will find me it's sort of sad in its own words so definitely seek this one as an obvious choice if you've not experienced the national I highly recommend all right one more obvious choice and and this might be obvious depending on who you are and maybe obvious if you aren't but I think it's obvious because of a couple of tie-ins that it had. And I mentioned a band last week called Bell X1, and they were originally put together with a different name, this Juniper. Um, but that lineup included an artist by the name of Damian Rice. And the fact that it's so hard to get this record um, would tell me that this is probably popular enough to go in the obvious choice category. This too is a gatefold. It's got all the lyrics inside. I do like when they do that. It's sort of a throwback to the 60s and 70s, some of those earlier gatefolds when they would do that. Um, but this is a phenomenal singer-songwriter album. Um, not crooning like a pop star. He is almost crying out in pain through some of these tracks. Uh, very, 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 very well-written songs. Um, that evoke, again, uh, a feeling of somber sort of uh, atmosphere. And while a lot of people might say, okay, well, who is Damien Rice, dude? I think he is, uh, I guess, better known in the NPR singer-songwriter fan club circle, maybe. But for me, if you've heard The Blower's Daughter, and I bet you have even if you don't know that name, I think you would know who Damien Rice is. So this album in particular, every single song on it is fantastic. Um, Exceptional Moments uh, I Remember, which has like a two-part version of the song. It starts with Damien Rice 
uh, or it starts with the, the female co counterpoint in his group playing a, a, a somber, soft female vocal. Um, and then it, it all builds into this place of very loud acoustic guitars with almost like him uh, screaming the vocal without screams. It's not like a metal scream. It's more of a, a power moment. Um, but lyrically speaking, even the song on here, Cannonball, um, is uh, you float like a cannonball. Um, it's sort of, uh, that's not the way it's sung. <laughs> You're floating like a cannonball. In that phrasing, um, that's a simile that makes zero sense, but it's, it's a way of saying that you don't float at all. Um, and there's a term for that, I should know, but it's escaping me at the moment. Anyhow, um, this record gives me chills when I listen to it, and it was one of my uh, earliest introductions into, I guess, the sad bastard category as far as playing on a loop and not being able to stop, and um, I would commit this entire album to memory like yesterday if you have the time. All right, moving right along. I think that's enough in the obvious sort of bigger artist category. I want to talk about some names that maybe have a lesser known um, I guess quality to them. These are artists you probably haven't heard of, or if you have, maybe you haven't really played with their music. And being that I'm from Arizona, I want to start with a person who hails from here, a female singer-songwriter, uh, one by the name of Courtney Marie Andrews. Um, she's getting a lot of fame overseas more recently, and she continues to put out really good music that sort of plays in the space of folk, um, pop singer, and definitely country. Um, and, and you might be saying, well, I don't like any of those things. Well, her unique blend of all three creates something different. Um, not to be confused with like later work from Joan Baez, um, and definitely not to be confused with more recent additions to the music scene of like Phoebe Bridgers. This is completely and uniquely on its own sort of place. And I love her music beyond this record, but this album is um, one that really got me started with her music. It's called On My Page, um, and the song of the same name, which is not the last track, but the pin ultimate track on the album, is the, my personal favorite, which is why I know she, she named this song for it. There are some very subtle stylings in the work um, that she does on the guitars here, but some very sophisticated uh, background accompaniment that she built in the studio. Uh, since putting out this record, she has definitely grown as a singer-songwriter. She's definitely grown in what she's willing to do and the risks she's willing to take. I know she's done some work with, with guys from um, uh, Damien Gerardu, or I think that's how you say his last name, and Jimmy Eat World, and a number of other uh, bigger name artists that have sort of helped her in the studio. But on this record um, in particular, uh, when I think it was when she first got to Fat Possum Records, is where she sort of took what she was good at um, on her own as like a 14-year-old guitarist, if, you know, when she really started making music, and turned it into... Um, I guess a, a not a commercial sound, but an accessible one. One that um, anybody does, doesn't have to be somebody who necessarily is looking for that music, um, might turn and say, this is really good. Um, and so just wanting to give like a local, local tip of the hat to somebody. I know she didn't really come to fame in Phoenix. It was more so when she got to Seattle and definitely more so overseas. But if you have not heard of Courtney Marie Andrews, uh, seek her out. Uh, she, she deserves uh, all of the attention her really good music is worth. So, All right, let's talk about something that falls into a category of you should probably know part of this or the person that's attached to it, but this project may have gone uh, without your noticing. Um, and it's a little less on the singer-songwriter side, but a little uh, definitely more able to be recognized as sadder music from this particular person. Um, so let's pull this album out right here. And it's weird to me because I'm only noticing it now, but my hat, uh, amongst many of the colors on all these records, have a, a color trend to them. Um, I would suppose, even, even uh, Downward Spiral back there, uh, without really thinking about it, there's, I guess, a uncanny bleakness that comes with taupe. I, I never would have thought, but uh, just recognizing that in this moment, couldn't help but notice. This is Ugly Casanova, a sub-pop output, the only album 
they ever released. Um, and if you're saying, well, who, who is a part of that guy? Who is that? Well, Isaac Brock uh, of Modest Mouse fame. And uh, Modest Mouse was a band that started in college circles, a very stripped down sound, and blew up to being a, a very large scale commercial uh, band. This album, Sharpen Your Teeth, um, sort of reminds me more of the earlier days of Modest Mouse, but in a very polished way. Um, Kings of Convenience, uh, even Pinbacky, um, Pinback esque. <laughs> but something about this is, is definitely somber. Um, there's very, very uh, subtle uses of percussion at times, and there is definitely some, some afterthought to how they, they build uh, multiple vocal parts and then dub them over and over so they get these kind of haunting noises in the way they sing. Uh, Barnacles is kind of a funner song. It's the way the album kicks off, but then really beyond that, I think it stays in a place of, of sort of uh, darker for indie rock music. Um, if you've ever heard of a band called Chin Up Chin Up, I would see that kind of uh, fan base touring with like a uh, ugly Casanova shirt on showing up and, and just being like, yeah, I like ugly Casanova. I don't like modest mouse, that sort of thing. But this album is great. Um, and for all reasons, that's probably why sub pop put it out. Um, this is a re-release, um, from 2013. The album had came out in 20 or 2002. So about 10 years after it is a really cool variant. I, I do want to show it off a little bit, although that's not what this is about. Um, but again, here we are with this freaking taupe color. Um, maybe that's just the thing. I guess taupe is sad. So if your walls are painted taupe, um, cover them up. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you can do about that. Uh, black's probably not the answer. All right, let's, let's move along, uh, continuing to talk about singer-songwriters and things. This guy I want to mention is a person whose, whose most recent output was not my favorite, but um, the particular album I'm going to show you was by far my favorite release of his. And, and this is Ben Howard. Um, he actually had a couple of minutes where I think he had a chance to sort of do some things and become like an Ed Sheeran type person in other markets, not in the United States. Um, and he turned it down. And he, uh, by own definition, one of the times I saw him live uh, is a sad, not the word I've been using, but one that starts with a C. And I'll let you uh, figure out what that is, being that he's from from uh, <laughs> from across the sea. Uh, this is output on island. Uh, typically for me, if I see a record and I don't even know what it is, especially more vintage ones, and island released it, I almost always buy it. Island has a, a knack for signing really good music. Um, Thrice for me in high school, that was like a huge thing for me when they were on that label. Um, but across the board, uh, John Martin, uh, just just very very good output. Even even lesser genre music than you would expect on such a big label once upon a time. But talking about this this record, um, I was fortunate enough to see Ben a couple of times. Uh, once in uh, Tennessee at the Bottom Bonneville Music Festival, um, early on before this record got an official release. Uh, and there is a the title track, I forget where we were, there is a moment where he actually sings into the pickups of his guitar. Um, and, and I guess it's sort of a shout. He has a delicate voice most of the time, but in this moment, not unlike the Damien Rice I Remember song, there is some sort of disdain that you can feel the character or the, the counterpart that he is singing about um, becomes him. He takes on his emotional uh, anger in some sort of way that channels through music. And I think that as a vehicle for humans and musicians alike, music is meant to sort of be an outlet. It's supposed to be this sort of cathartic thing. That's everything that this record is. Um, every song on here is fantastic. Rivers in Your Mouth, uh, um, Time is Dancing, really playful guitar instrumentation to start that song, which I think fits with a title like Time is Dancing, although it's not a dancey song by any means. Um, Conrad is very low on the, tre on, the, on the register and the pacing, but all together, my favorite record in 2014 at the end of the year. It was absolutely bar none to everything else that came out that year. Um, the cover, the title, everything. Very crisp, nuanced. I love this aesthetic. I love the music. And um, I just love this album.
Have to, have to, have to give a little shout to Ben Howard on that one. All right, let's keep talking. Let's keep going. What's happening? My computer's doing something. Oh, still recording. Okay. Um, oddly enough, I want to talk about one last obscure track, but the artist is actually doing a, a live benefit concert for COVID uh, tomorrow night. So tomorrow night is May 1st, 2020. Depending on what period of time you're watching this video, you may not have the opportunity to see it. But if you don't, the lead singer of this band I'm about to share with you actually came and played music at my home once upon a time, and you can find that on my channel. Although we unfortunately had the lights really low and the camera we used didn't pick it up all that well, you can still hear it. Gorgeous. This is the honorary title, uh, aka Jared Gorbell, um, aka Doghouse Music's putting out a bunch of emo. Bands like Limbeck are sort of playing with what it means to be that kind of band. Um, and this is definitely more so in the vein of a singer songwriter record about breakup and heartbreak and, and all of the sadness that comes along with like those early love feelings when they get dissipated um but wow uh this record hit me like a ton of bricks in 2005 uh, i personally went through a pretty bad breakup and this record was right there for me when i needed it and and the art says a lot um i love that enjoy the ride records which is a really cool smaller label that puts out unique stuff um you know, video game and movie soundtracks and Nickelodeon records um, and, and things like this uh, did this. I, I even have a test pressing of one of their EPs. Uh, this is a cool variant I will show in a second, but uh, there's Jared right there. Um, these songs are, are painfully sad. Um, and there's moments of like sort of, uh, I guess almost like flirtation in the way he describes the stories. But there is definitely uh, an air to, to solitude at the end. It's anything else but the truth is really uh, <laughs> summative in this point. Uh, Snow Day is a, is a great song with a catchy lick in the middle. Uh, Cats and Heat, sort of the uh, ending of the original album to me, uh, definitely tells the story emotionally through the way the like first four bars of the drums hit uh, you can get where you're headed right there and it finishes the album well uh frame by frame bridge and tunnel everything i once had is definitely the saddest song on here everything i once had being another one of those songs with a a crescendo at the end where the lyricist sort of takes takes the vocal to another place um definitely sort of thematic amongst sort of sad uh i guess singers trying to really let you feel their pain um but a phenomenal record all the same. Um, so looking at what they did for this release, uh, I want to show you one of the variants. If I can get this out of here, I don't want <laughs> Well, I never. Anyhow, uh, it's two pieces. So uh, the second LP, C and D, just a green, kind of solid green color uh, LP there. And the first one, uh, sides A and B, is different. Uh, and I love how they've used the art to create the labels. Um, kind of weird to me when they have like a solid LP along with the splatter LP. I don't really know what the point of that is, but that's cool. Um, this is like a half and half. Uh, I almost feel like it would have been more complimentary to do the same thing and like swap it out on the other side. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Again, it's not for me the aesthetic value of variants and colors that I'm really after. It's the music. And uh, if you've never played with the honorary titles stuff, if you're fans of like the Spill Canvas or uh, even more recently, I would say the 1975, um, you would probably like the honorary title. Uh, although the music is definitely more stripped down than either of those bands. Okay, now this is a music show. No music show would be complete without a headliner. So I definitely want to give you one this episode. There is no bigger sad bastard in the world of music, in my opinion, than Elliot Smith. Um, poor guy took his own life um, in a very painful way, too, from what I gather. Look at that. There's that color again. Um, but while I have a number of records, I always like to showcase the headliners few uh, that I have. Um, there is a lot of love for me 
for From a Basement on a Hill. This is a phenomenal piece of work that came out posthumously, posthumously, after he passed away. Figure eight's also really good. This picture, uh, so many people have recreated it. If you go to that wall in California, I used to live in Los Angeles. I know all about it. But I want to say, if you're going to buy this on vinyl right now, a record from Elliot Smith should be Either Or. Uh, Either Or is a fantastic collection of songs. Speed Trials, Ballad of Big Nothing, No Name Number Five. I love that he does that sometimes. Uh, Rose Parade is a great song. Um, very, very uh, compellingly sad music, but ultimately so well, well done. Uh, for somebody who, who dealt with pain in such a way that it came out through his music, I think uh, we were all very fortunate to get as much from him as we did before he is no longer with us. Um, and really his entire body of work, there, there are a few songs I dislike. Uh, I guess I shouldn't even use that word that I would say that I don't uh, love. <laughs> um, but this album is one that I, I've had two or three different points of time where I've gone back to and fallen in love with all over again. And I think that's a testament to him. Um, obviously, Kill Rock Stars put this out. Um, this is a repress from a couple of years ago. I love the Kill Rock Stars uh, sheet they put inside. Um, single LP. Um, it's not 180 gram, but they do use a very nice Inter inner sleeve if that means something to you guys uh, who are watching but wow uh, if you've never given Elliot Smith more time than I guess a song that you heard on the Royal Tenenbaums definitely seek out this record um, I'm gonna put together a sad bastard playlist and stick it down below in the uh, boxes and let you listen to I guess one of each song off all these records we've talked about um, we're an interesting time as a species, as a planet, as, as, a, as a group dealing with, uh, you know, the COVID situation. And I think sad music has uh, its own way of taking us to a, a better place. Even though it's sad, it's sort of transformative, and it's uh, definitely something that um, we can utilize as a way to connect with other people. Because, you know what, if we're sad and somebody else is sad, they are similar to me. And now I'm not a sad person all by myself. And so while I, I have had um, only minor bouts of depression in my life, I think I can attest every time that I have had those moments uh, to being able to come through it because of music. Music to me is just that important. It is sort of my savior. Um, and that's why I collect records, and that's why I do this, because it helps me. It's, it's, it's an experience. And I would love to hear about some of your favorite sad singer, sad depressed records that you spin from time to time. If you have a few, um, please leave me a comment below. I got two great suggestions last week, both of which I, I, I ended up listening to several times, and one I ordered on record today, uh, Honey Harper. Very good stuff. So thank you for the suggestion. I uh, look forward to doing this once a week. I know they're kind of long, but hey, we're just talking about music here, and you can leave whenever you want, right? If you stayed the whole time, thank you. Cheers to you. I would appreciate a like, a thumbs up, a comment, a subscribe, a bell ding, all of those cool things. Um, until next week, happy spinning.